Uh, God bless you that are learning. I believe there are more students in God's Word at this moment than ever before in the history of mankind. <laughs> That's great. Now, we are not diminishing and we are not getting smaller. We are getting bigger. And we thank God for it. And we thank God for truths like this. Uh, I believe there is a more of God that we can know, that I can know. And we're seeking. And those that seek Him, the Bible says, they shall find Him. And so we are reaching out there because the Bible tells us to reach out. We are not contradicting the Word, but we are showing God that the material things of this life do not overwhelm us, that we know there's a place in God, uh, and we are going to get that place in God. I, I feel sorry uh, for s some people because their minister is not converted and, and doesn't know what it means to be born again, and because of that has very little knowledge of the Most High God. He knows about smoking, and he knows about drinking, and he knows about dancing, and he knows about, uh, you know, a lot of things, but he, he doesn't know the Most High God. In a, in a system like that, you have no hope. If your leader doesn't know how you're going to know, unless you come to my class. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we wish all people of all denominations would say, it's time to seek the Most High. And, and, and uh, no doubt Moses sought him for 40 years there and he found him, you see. And so we believe that, that seeking God pays off. Amen. Now, we are at lesson two. And I, I do hope that everyone has your beautiful teaching syllabus. On, on, on the left-hand side, please make your notes. In our last study, I gave several things that were not in your text. And I hope that you made note of them there. Of course, you will still have them in the audio tape. You can also purchase a videotape of it if you wish. Now, searching for the Most High. We've moved from our introduction now of saying who is this Most High and how the Jews that we get our, our, our truth of God from, uh, of how they respected Him. Now, searching for the Most High. From the time of Adam's loss of personal relationship and intimate fellowship with the Most High, each succeeding generation has sought to communicate with the Most High some way or another. Some made it and some, some didn't. We wish to join the search for knowledge of the Most High. These lessons are an in-depth exploration of theism. We want to know God. We're seeking to know God. And, and uh, we're crying out to know God. And, and we believe that we're, we're going to find results in our hearts and we're going to rejoice in, in our knowledge, in our knowledge of God. To search, to search for the Most High, we must challenge history, no doubt. We must explore all truth made available to us. What an amazing challenge there is in your heart, in my heart, to know better the Most High God. It all begins in Genesis. Let's look in Genesis 3.22. And Jehovah said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand to take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now that brings you to point one. Man lost our relationship with the Most High. Now you know, we're, we're all just one generation from pagans, you know. I mean, I mean, our whole nation is just one generation from pagans. The present generation can know God. The next generation can know nothing about God. Now, there, there have been nations like that on the face of this earth. That in one generation, they didn't respect God and receive God. And the next generation, the knowledge of God was gone. What you and I are doing is bringing to a rebirth the knowledge of the Most High God. That we can teach it to our children. And we are not ready to lose the reality of knowing the Most High God. Now, in your point one, in the beginning of his creation, Adam personally knew the Most High. I mean, he personally knew Him. He held arms with Him. He held hands with Him. He walked with Him. So he walked and talked with the Most High against whom Adam volitionally rebelled. Now, you, we put that in there to show you that it was not an accident. He did not make a mistake. He, in his own insides, says, I want to explore doing what God doesn't want me to do. Now, you can explore sin if you want to. But the wages of sin is death, you see. And he, he explored. Satan says you'll get as wise as God, and you will be great if you will do this. 
and he, he refused God's counsel and accepted another counsel. And if we do the same, then we will cease to know the Most High God. All right. Uh, Adam destroyed his friendship and his fellowship and his relationship with the Most High God. And no one has ever had that, that identical relationship from that day until today. Through Adam, humans lost the majesty of Elohim and began to walk in ignorance, in superstition, and in demon deception. In Adam, all men die. Now, I'd, if you were a preacher, put a whole circle around that thing and preach your heart out on it. It, it, it just gets to me that through this one man, our father, you're seeing, our father Adam, through him and his volitional and in, intentional rebellion against God, he, he, he lost the majesty of the mighty Elohim uh, that, made, that made all things. And began to walk in ignorance and began to walk in superstition, began to walk in demon and demon deception. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For as in Adam all die, being our father, and our, his blood in our veins we die. Even so is Christ, in Christ shall all be made alive. When we become born into the family of God, we come back into a, in a relationship to where we can know God now. We leave that dark relationship and into a light relationship to where we can know God. Since Adam, erroneous teachings always stem from the lack of a personal knowledge of the Most High God. Now, brother, for every cult in this country, whether it's Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses at all, the, or even Mohammedism, Mohammedism got on the face of this earth because there wasn't great teaching on God. You, you can't imagine how important this is for you to get out and talk about it and tell people that you know God. And they, they don't know whether there's one there or not, you know. And, and we, we have cults on the face of the earth, and the reason for it is no personal knowledge of the Most High. When people have a personal knowledge of the Most High, they stay out of cults because they know the Most High. Without the Most High, man's greatest desire, without the Most High, man's greatest desire is to realize God. Uh, he, 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 he has a desire for it, but he, he doesn't reach it. Man's greatest adventures are in the pursuit of the knowledge of the Most High God. The very spirit and soul of the human person senses in its origin and forever longs and desires to return to its source of knowing the Most High God. I don't believe there's a human living that inside of him he doesn't yearn to know the one that created those stars and made those mountains and made those seas and made us. I, I don't believe there's a human living that would not like to be acquainted with the one who created it all. Now the chief adversary of keeping us back from knowing the Most High God, from the time of Adam's fall and his loss of fellowship with God, man sought to know God. In every generation, man has sought some way to know God. Many times he went to idol worship, it, trying to know God. The evil one, which is Satan, or the devil, has taken advantage of man's thirst for God and has given him counterfeit idols, counterfeit dreams, in order for him to worship. Man's hope, man hopes these images of mud, of stone, of wood, of silver, of gold, will in some way restore him to the fellowship of immortality. Sad and pitiful. For man to be limited to such a knowledge of the Most High, which is no knowledge at all. The Bible says that at the time of this ignorance, God winked at it. He was so upset with it. But now commandeth men, all men everywhere, to repent. That's in Acts 17 and 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God desires that men know Him. God is not trying to hide from us. You're in the right attitude, in the right spirit in, in, in this great class. God is not trying to hide from us. Uh, God wants to identify with us. Let's find the veil that, re that removes us from God and move it away, and then we shall see Him. And we shall come into that knowledge of Him. It, it is satanic transgression and rebellion, always, totally, that separates man from his God. And let's read again Romans 1. And this time, verses 18 to 25. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, we should remember that. God is un very unhappy with all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. God just, God never feels good about sin. And if you think he does, then you don't know him. Because that which 
may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. Now look at that verse 19 carefully. Because that, that which may be known of God, his reality, uh, his knowledge of himself, God has showed it unto them. And I think he showed it unto me. He says, I am ready to reveal myself to you. I am ready for you to know more about me than ever before. And, and so that's what we're working on, that we, we have this reality. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The pagan, the heathen, is without excuse in knowing God. Because that when they knew God, that's going back maybe to, to Noah's grandchildren, you see. Noah's grandchildren. That they had to know God because Noah told them about it. Became empty in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be miles, wise. Man always wants to be smarter than God. He got it built into him. Trying to be smarter than God. Profess themselves to be wise. They become fools. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. You know, you know, when they first took the book of Romans and translated it into Chinese, a group of Chinese scholars came around and said, uh, you're trying to fool us, aren't you? And, and the, the translator said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, this is us. What'd you put Rome on it for? He says, this should be the book of the Chinese. He says, this fits us, you know, to call this not the book of Romans, but the book of the Chinese. Well, it's not the book of the Chinese. It's a book for the whole world, for every race, for every nation, for every tribe. Uh, for all people, that they, they made an image. Imagine this was written here uh, 2,000 years ago. Made, made, made images like men, like birds. Uh, I could bring you pictures of those, of those gods that are uh, part woman and part bird. And, and four-footed beasts. They got all kind of gods that are nothing but, but animals. Great, terrible-looking creatures sitting at the doors of their temples of, like they would tear you to pieces, creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. And that's what all pagan religion is. Uh, through the lusts of their own hearts, immoralities, to discover their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. That goes back to just after Noah's time. And a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, you see who is blessed uh, forever. Now, it's only Satan that calls the Most High the unknown. The Greek intellectuals on Mars Hill in Athens, when Paul arrived there, they had many gods to present. They had Zeus, they had Mars, they had Apollo, Jupiter, they had Mercury. But they had these gods by legends, they had them by traditions. They had them by old tales. These gods that were just stars sailing through the heavens every night. And they made myths about them, of how great they were. The Most High was unknown to them. He was named the unknown God. So when they inscribed all the names of their gods, they put at the bottom, the unknown God. There was one that they didn't know anything about. You see, that's what I was telling you about that deep down desire within everybody's heart. You may have 500 gods, and on the other side, you say, well, there's a good one over there if I could get to him. But you can't get to him through that bunch of trash. You got to get sweep that out of the way before you can get to the true God. You can't get to him through all that junk. You won't ever find him going through other gods. That is not a possibility. So Paul said in Acts 17, 22, Paul stood in, Mars, in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. Boy, that got their attention. That got their attention calling those wise men superstitious, you know, got their attention. He said, as I passed by and beheld your devotions, they were all out there worshiping these idols. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. <laughs> You're doing it in ignorance. I'd like to make him a reality to you. I'd like to, like, let, to let you know all about him. He has one nose and two eyes. I'd like to tell you about that. He has arms of love. I'd like to tell you about that. He says, I, I, I want to declare him unto you. And then he began in verse 24 and shattered all the gods he had. God that made the world and all things therein. That took care of all of it right there. I'm sure they looked at one another and said, what are we going to hear now? That he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Hey, that took care of the rest of it. 
Yeah, he was a God of the stars and gods of the sea and, every, and every, everywhere, of heaven and earth. He dwelleth not in your little old stinky temples. Excuse me for adding a word there. Yeah. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. That was the greatest shocker wave that ever hit Athens, right there. What was it? It was the knowledge of the Most High. It was the knowledge of the Most High. You see? Swept away their dead gods and gave them a knowledge of the Most High. And hath made, and, and this, this brought them together. Verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. That got them. They, 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 they thought they themselves were the smart people of the world and the others were servants to them on the face of the earth or slaves unto them and that they were not equal at all. And he said that God has made all men who dwell on the face of the earth, that meant all of them, and hath determined the times before appointed, that took care of a lot of more of their gods, and the bounds of their habitations, that they should seek Jehovah. Woo. They didn't do it. That they should seek Jehovah if after they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any of us. I want you to know those intellectuals are getting it that day. They never forgot that day that this man heralded this from the crown of the peak where all the lectures were held in that great city. Listen to what he says about him. He is not far from any of us. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also his offspring. And that curled a man. They said, hey, I'm glad that we have a little part in this anyway. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, see, God made us, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold, silver, stone, graven by art and man's device. That took care of their idols. Swept it clean of their idols. So the Most High is unreachable by human devices. Job asked this question in Job 11 and 7, Canst thou by searching find out God? Uh, canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? And not by natural means you won't, you'll come up with an idol. You'll come up with something that soothes your conscience. And you won't, you won't come up with the reality of the true God who made the heavens and the earth. Now for an object of this we go to point five. And we discover a man. He was 10 generations from Noah, who knew God personally, and, and, that, uh, and that understood God, because God talked with him, God made a covenant with him. And so each one of us represents five generations, so it was two of them. Uh, you, yourself, uh, you know your grandfather, you know your father, you know yourself, you know your son, you know your grandson. So every one of us represents five generations. There were only two of those between Noah and Abraham. No lost space, no lost time. All you needed was two men to tell you the whole story, just like it was from Noah unto Abraham. The world did not go through a dark period. They, only two men had to know the truth, and, and, and those men were there in great abundance, far more than that. Abraham was born and reared in the area of Ur of the Chaldees. He was directed in life by his deep longing in his heart for the Most High. Now, if you want to know the secret of Abraham, it's in that little paragraph that Abraham had a deep longing in his heart for the Most High. In Genesis 17, 1, when Abraham was 90 years old, 99 years old, Jehovah appeared in, to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. You're going to see why I put that on the front of your teaching syllabus before we get through. The Most High seeing the Almighty. <laughs> the Bible's full of it. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to become a more acquainted I was the Most High. We want to see the Almighty. And, and, and that's the theme of all of these lessons. He says, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, he found the way. If you would walk before him with what knowledge you have, and, and, and if you would have right before him, be perfect, uh, then you would come to know the Most High. You're, you are in the right position, in the right place, with the right attitude to know the Most High, maybe as no one else in the whole of our nation. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Who else is doing what you're doing right now? Sitting down and saying, I am going to know the Most High. You see? And that is exactly what we're doing. Abraham explained it this way. Uh, he said, 
I am looking for a city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is the most high. <laughs> he, he wanted to live with him forever because Adam had lived with him. After the first revelation of the most high, Abraham spent the remainder of his life in pursuit of a greater knowledge and greater experience of the most high God. He didn't stop. The problem with most folks is that when they get a bit of a revelation of the most high, they are satisfied and they quit and they don't penetrate and they don't go deeper. And so all they have is an elementary uh, a primary view of the Most High and have never moved in deeper to have a greater understanding of the Most High and using His strength and His force and His wisdom in our daily activities. In our daily activities. I think, I think, I think the greater revelation of God that we have, the more supernatural we're going to live. Isaiah's quest for the Most High. One of the great men of the whole of the Bible. In Isaiah 40, 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, Je the Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding? Yeah. By searching, he meant by the philosophers of the world and by the intellectuals of the world that they simply could not search out this understanding. Now, your number seven, Paul recognized this. We're just using... You know, just a few of them. We don't want to take you through the whole scope of the word. Paul recognized the, the unreachableness of the Most High by natural means. By, by natural means. In Romans eleven thirty three. 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. And his ways are past finding out. We are the, the created. He is the creator, and we have a way and a means to understand him as no other creatures in the universe will ever, ever get to know him. If you don't mind looking a little further, uh, there was a man by the name of Moses. For 40 years, Moses traveled the vast expanses of the Sinai Desert. He was in search of the Most High. Yeah, there were a few sheep following him around, but uh, they had a lot more than sheep on his brain. And he was looking for the Most High. One day he observed a small umbrella-shaped tree that lit up like a furnace. We've seen many of those little trees, little old flat things. And he saw one light up like a furnace. At first, Moses must have considered the desert uh, phenomenon uh, a mirage, a mirage. As he approached the burning tree, uh, which was not consumed, it, Moses discovered that the Most High God was right there was right there, that his Shekinah glory that used to rest over the, over the cherubim in the Holy of Holies was right out there in the desert. You know, God will meet you anywhere you want to meet him. Yeah, it was right out there in the desert. And uh, look at it. It's in Exodus 3 and 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. He, that's strong. And thou, and thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now, 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 when God said that, that's what has baffled uh, the Hebrew people from that time uh, unto this day. When God began to express his names, they became afraid to pronounce them even. But he says, I, my name is I am, which means that he is not I was or I will be. There is no, no will be to it. He is eternally I am. That means there is no yesterday and tomorrow with God. He, he, he exists. He is. And by being I am... He is for all eternity to the left and all eternity to the right. He forever, he forever exists. In the Word of God, we discover people, uh, for example, like the Queen of Sheba, uh, an intellectual and a ruler, and she was, uh, she was seeking to know the Most High. One of the most remarkable instances that we have anywhere in history of a person seeking the Most High is that of this queen who, who ruled in North Africa. In her African kingdom, she, she heard that there was a, a man who was a king in Jerusalem and in Israel, and that he had information about the Most High. Have you read why she went over there? She wanted to find out how he went up to worship God, she told him. And he, she watched him worship. So in 1 Kings 10 and 1, it says, And when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. Did you catch it? Are you here? Yeah. 
that she heard about Solomon concerning the name of Jehovah. That's what drove her there, a quest to know the Most High. She came to prove him, to see how much she knew about God, to see if he could tell her something about God that she didn't know. That's the reason we say that in all generations there are people seeking after God. And they are always very beautiful people, just like the people in this class, you know, reaching out and seeking after the Most High.